In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, on this uh, special Sunday, this Gaudete, Rejoice Sunday in Advent, we ask you to give us the spirit of joy, eager anticipation. Help us to have high hopes in your promises. Help us have high hopes for this particular hour. As we look into the scriptures, we ask you to reveal yourself to us, Lord God, through the inspired words of St. Mark. Help us to just be fertile ground so that this good seed of the good word can be planted deep in us and bring forth that harvest of faith, hope, and love that you want. In Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. All right, so in the big picture, Jesus' ministry in Galilee is now long over. He's traveled south. He's gone to Judea, through Judea. He's gone across the Jordan River. And it's been some time, even though it's not a lot of ink in Mark, for probably for months, he's been on the far side of the Jordan River continuing to preach and teach. Uh, this is an area that's outside of Israel proper, but it was settled by Jews. We now know from history, King Herod invited a, uh, a, uh, f a family of Jews that were still in, were, uh, in Babylon, the area where they had gone many years before, and had still not returned. And as part of this continual resettlement effort that the Maccabeans started and that Herod continued, he invited a particular family to come and live in this area of Transjordania or Perea because they were, it was kind of a lawless area. And they were well known for being good horsemen and bowmen. So he wanted this, this group loyal to Israel, which was his kingdom, to come down and live there and sort of be good tenants. All right? So we know that, that from history. So Jesus found a, a, uh, a, uh, a good audience there. Right? So he's there. In the other scriptures, it tells us that he went a time or two up to Bethany, which is close to Jerusalem. But in Mark's narrative, he had not been in Jerusalem yet. Uh, but in chapter 11, it says, as he was approaching Jerusalem. It's also good, and we mentioned last time, from where he was at to Jerusalem meant, very prophetically, in the context of the geography, he was, he was now, what's the right word, bivouacking. He'd been camping in the same area that the Israelites had been camping after they completed their journey through the desert. You know, right? Where they were at, where... Moses was giving them final instructions and then he handed leadership over to Yeshua which is interpreted sometimes as Joshua but we know we learned it could also be interpreted as Jesus and so Jesus is kind of redoing all of that after the sojourn he's now giving last instructions and then he's going to cross the Jordan River just like Joshua led the Israelites across carrying the Ark of the Covenant and go straight to the first town that they encountered was Jericho, all right? And then that's exactly where Jesus is going to go. And at the end of the conquest of, the, of Israel, uh, Israel, which took a number of centuries, the last town that the, the uh, Israelites took was the land of the Jebusites, which was Jerusalem. So Jesus is sort of reenacting that. I mean, the footsteps he's taking and the actions that he's doing physically are also prophetic. And, and trying to tell them, that all happened in anticipation of what I'm doing now. I'm the, the point of all that. That may that seemed bigger to you, but in, in actuality, that was just the appetizers, right? The, the main course has come, and now he's doing that same thing. So we've already had him go through uh, Jericho, I think, last week. That's where he met Bartimaeus, the blind man, etc. It wasn't that where he met the rich young man. Several questions along the way that he had answered. And uh, so, chapter 11 began with, As he approached Jerusalem, he went to Bethphage and Bethany. And Mark, he doesn't stay there long, but we know he knows he has friends in Bethany, maybe in Bethphage as well. These towns probably, probably had a heavy Essene influence, by the way. And I don't want to get into that. You've heard me do that. And by the way, now it's time for me to pull out... Father Pixner's other book. <laughs> the one I began with that I recommend was with Jesus in Galilee. Now he wrote another book which I haven't read in years really. And I, I pulled it out this week and mainly last night and reread it and it blew my mind all over again. It's just so gripping. 
the way he takes his knowledge of the places and the customs and the and puts it together with his research of the people and the story and mixes it all together. It's it's uh, fantastic. And so anyway, if you're able to I'm going to ask for it for Christmas, maybe someone you love will give you a copy of that. Uh, that's right, either one of them. So Father Pixner's is with Jesus in Jerusalem. This one is. The subtitle is His First and Last Days in Judea. All right, and he, he, he takes parts from Mark, but all the, all the Gospels. And Bargill Pixner, and his first book looks just like this, different picture, and it's called With Jesus in Galilee. Okay? Because Father Pixner did archaeological work in both places, etc. But I don't want to give him another commercial because he obviously is a, I'm a big fan. Anyway, so, all right, so uh, the barren fig tree, he's in Bethany, and I told you he's ba mainly staying in Bethany at night, and then during the day, this is the first time he's going to be going to Jerusalem, though, every day, teaching primarily in the temple area. But on this first day, he went, and this is where he got the donkey, he was fulfilling scriptures, uh, prophecies uh, from Psalms and Zechariah especially, and, and uh, he enters Jerusalem, topping the Mount of Olives, and as soon as he topped it, you can see the Temple Mount right there, it's just on the side, the little Kidron Valley is not doesn't have buildings and homes in it because it sometimes floods in the spring. So it's, it's sometimes it's a creek and there's a river there. I mean, I mean there's a, a road there, not a lot of structures because it's an area of floods. So it's mainly just um, open. So when you top the Mount of Olives, you, there's this little small valley and then there's Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, which at that time had the Solomon's Temple on it, is right there. So it would have been very striking for the apostles and Jesus as soon as they topped it. But all the people, a lot of excitement, and I posited last week is mainly because he had already raised Lazarus from the dead, remember? Yeah. And uh, had done that and gone back to Transjordania. And now they hear he's back again. And this time the word is spread because Lazarus was very well known in the area. He's only two miles from Jerusalem. Probably spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. And a lot of the Jews from Jerusalem had come out to be to mourn with Mary and Martha when he died. They witnessed the miracle and then told all their friends. So this time when Jesus comes back, the people are really excited. Mm -hmm. This is why they ran out. They're going, Hosanna to, and to, to right? Okay, all the rest of it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they put their cloaks and they put palm branches. So this is the original Palm Sunday. Okay? The beginning of Passion Week. The next day then, he went back to Bethany. The next day he's going to Jerusalem again. Uh, this is where he sees the fig tree. It didn't have any figs on it. So he cursed it. It's the only, like I said, the only destructive miracle I can think of. Uh, and he said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And I, I don't know. The best explanation I have of that is that often in the Old Testament, the people of Israel are, are uh, metaphorized as fig trees or grapevines. They're God's orchard or God's vineyard. So... Um, it could be that this time of judgment, and the judgment is not good. We're going to see that play out even more in the next chapter or two. That the Messiah has come, the owner of the vineyard, and he's going to give a parable about this very thing here in a couple minutes, has come back, and the tenants he left in charge have been unfaithful and wicked. Right? So it could be that. He's going to see this fig tree again in a minute when, it, when he returns. Well, actually, the next morning. But this day, he goes on in Jerusalem, and, and this on this first day is when he goes to the temple, and he's very unhappy with what he sees going on there. And we've talked about this in the other gospel, because it's also in Matthew and Luke and John, actually, I think. So anyway, he, get, he gets there, and what he sees is what they call money changers in the outer court. If you remember, the Temple Mount was built with the Holy of Holies in the middle, or the, the, the heart of it the compound. No one could go in there except the high priest once a year. And then there were outer courts that the priest could go on and then it was Jewish men and then it was Jewish women and then the outer court was for the Gentiles who wanted to come and pray. That's as close as they could get. They could get but they could still get on the Temple Mount. You know, Gentiles of good heart. God-fearers. Righteous Gentiles they would call. So even in the Old Testament there was a place that was on the periphery as secondary to say the least, but it was, there was still a place even for the Gentile nations, okay? And that's where the 
the, uh, the priests had allowed the money changers to set up their tables. It was kind of a necessary function because everywhere else in Israel they had to use the Roman coin, the denarii, right? But they wouldn't let, because it had the image of Caesar on it, it was considered profane, a graven image. So they weren't allowed to use that money when they gave their offerings at the temple. They had to use temple money. It was useless anywhere else. So when they came there, they had to change their money. They wanted to give an offering. I had to have a change from denarii into the temple coin. Uh, so, but obviously they were charging a lot. It was probably kickbacks involved. But the people that let them have their business, uh, you know, greed, it was... And besides all that, this is also, by the way, where if you wanted to offer a sheep or a goat or even a cow and you lived in Galilee or somewhere, it's a lot easier to buy it when you get to Jerusalem than drag that critter all the way with you, right? <laughs> so they also sold the animals for sacrifice there. Just makes sense. Just makes sense. But, so, but when you picture now, so Jesus comes up onto this outer court, which is also supposed to be a place of prayer. And you have the clanging going on. You have the arguing about, you're cheating me, you're ripping me off, and shut up or get out of here, and all the stinky smells and the, the bleeding goats and the, the odors that go with all that. It didn't make Jesus happy. All right, So that's the context of this story. They reached Jerusalem and he went into the temple and began driving out the men selling and buying there. He upset the tables of the money changers and the seats of the dove sellers. Nor would he allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he taught them and said, Does not scripture say, My house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples? All peoples. That's, he's quoting Isaiah. Isaiah 56, 7. But you have turned it into a bandit's den. Den of thieves. This came to the ears of the chief priests and the scribes, and they tried to find some way of doing away with him. They were afraid of him because the people were carried away by his teaching. And when evening came, he went out of the city and went back to Bethany. <coughs> Jeremiah 7.11, we should look at just briefly before we move on. I had it marked there. Where are you, Jeremiah? Listen to this, Jeremiah's prophecy. Yahweh Sabaoth, the God of Israel, says this through the prophet Jeremiah. Amend your behavior and your actions, and I will let you stay in this place. Do not put your faith in delusive words such as, this is Yahweh's sanctuary. In other words, nothing can happen bad here. This is God's house. Jeremiah is telling them this is just before the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And at the end of that at the end of that siege, what happened? The temple was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. So he's telling them, don't think you're okay just because you live here and God is going to take care of you and every and this place because it's God's sanctuary. Do not put your faith in delusive words such as this is Yahweh's sanctuary. Yahweh's sanctuary, Yahweh's sanctuary. But if you really amend your behavior and your actions, and if you really treat one another fairly, if you do not exploit the stranger, the orphan, and the widow, if you do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own ruin, then I shall let you stay in this place, in the country I gave forever to your ancestors of old. Look, you're putting your faith in delusive, worthless words. Steal, would you? Murder, commit adultery, perjure yourselves, burn incense to Baal, follow other gods of whom you know nothing, and then come and stand before me in this temple that bears my name, saying, now we are safe to go on doing all these loathsome things. Do you look on this temple that bears my name as a den of bandits? I, at any rate, can see straight, Yahweh says. He says, go now go to the place that used to be mine at Shiloh. Shiloh is where they kept the Ark of the Covenant before they built the temple and brought it to Jerusalem. Go and look at that place, which at this time had been destroyed by the Philistines. It's rubble. Where I once gave my name a home. Now 
See what I have done to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, since you have done all these things, Yahweh declares, and refused to listen when I spoke so urgently, so persistently, or to answer when I called you, I shall treat this temple that bears my name and in which you put your heart, the place that I gave you and your ancestors, just as I treated Shiloh. And I shall drive you out of my sight as I did all your kinsfolk, kinsfolk the whole race of Ephraim. So by this prophetic action, and quote, even quoting from some of Jeremiah, he's beginning to let them know, I have come and I'm bringing the verdict. And it's not looking good. He's going to make that explicit in a parable he's going to tell in just a minute. Okay? But I just wanted you to know the context. He refers to Jeremiah really directly, if we know the scriptures. Very clear to those that did. Okay. I'm sorry, it's Jeremiah chapter 7. Well, I read more than verse 11. It's the second half of Jeremiah chapter 7. And it's the prophecy of Jeremiah of, of the first temple, but Jesus is saying that too was a prophetic action anticipating what I'm doing now. Most of the Old Testament only makes sense, or its greatest sense, if you read it through the fulfillment of the New Testament. But likewise, the New Testament makes a lot more sense if we understand how it's anticipated in the Old. That's how the two work together. Destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. These other temples have been rebuilt to only to be destroyed again. Right. Well, he's going to get really explicit about all of that destroying the temple stuff in chapter 13. So hang, hang in there. Okay. And the next morning he gets up from Bethany. Mary or Martha make him a nice breakfast. And they're going back to Jerusalem again. And they see again that fig tree that he cursed through previous day and it was withered to the roots Peter remembered look rabbi the fig tree that you cursed is withered away Jesus answered have faith in God I truth I tell you if anyone says to this mountain be pulled up and thrown into the sea with no doubt in his heart but believing that what he says will happen it will be done for him I tell you therefore everything you ask and pray for believe that you have it already A certain power in having that kind of faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Remember, we, we've got that from Hebrews. It's the, it is the evidence of the things not seen. It doesn't make sense to us because evidence is things that we do see. Now, faith replaces what we don't see with our natural eyes, allowing us to see it with spiritual eyes. Which, okay. So when you pray for something, pray with faith. And you can thank God ahead of time for the answer. If you prayed rightly, it'll be what you asked for. If you prayed wrongly, it'll be something else, but it'll still be answered. The answer might be no, or it might be later, or it might be something different. It might be better. might be better. So thank God for the answer ahead of time. But he also says, and when you stand in prayer, forgive whatever you have against anybody. It's not an option. He wasn't recommending, and if you really want to put some horsepower behind your prayers. No, this is like a basic command. You know, otherwise you're sort of wasting your time. It almost it sounds like. First thing you know, you don't have to elicit a forgiveness from them necessarily. But you have to forgive anybody you have something against. Or it's a great impediment to your prayer. That's our Lord's prayer. That's the Lord's prayer. We dare to say that. Forgive us to the degree or in the same way we forgive others. Ow. Alright. He says forgive whatever you have against anybody so that your Father in Heaven may forgive your failings too. <laughs> Alright. So they came to Jerusalem again. Third day. And as Jesus was walking in the temple the chief priests and the scribes and the elders who decided we'd have to do something with this guy. They now approach him. And they said to him, What authority have you for acting like this? They remember the mess he made yesterday. Right? Well, he made a mess in the temple. What authority do you have? Jesus said to them, he returns the serve here, 
I will ask you a question, just one. Answer me and I will tell you my authority for acting like this. His question was, John's baptism, was it, what was its origin, heavenly or human? Answer me that. They argued amongst themselves. If we say heavenly, he'll say, then why did you refuse to believe him? But if we say human, they had the people to fear, for everyone held that John had been a real prophet. So their reply to Jesus was, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, nor will I tell you my authority for acting like this. He'll tell him when he's good and ready. He won that exchange. There's going to be four questions. That's the first one. Before we get to the second one, he does this parable of the wicked tenants. All right. And so if the prophecy of Jeremiah wasn't pretty clear, he's going to say it in his own words. He went on to speak to them in parables. He said, a man planted a vineyard. Remember I told you vineyard is a metaphor for Israel. Okay. He fenced it around, dug out a trough for the wine press, and built a tower. Then he leased it to tenants and went abroad. When the time came, he sent a servant, the prophets, to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized the man, thrashed him, sent him away empty-handed. Next he sent another servant to them. Him they beat with about the head and treated shamefully. And he sent another, and, and him they killed. Then a number of others, and they thrashed some and killed the rest. He had still someone left, though, his beloved son. He sent him to them last of all, thinking, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to each other, this is the heir. Come on, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Now, what will the owner of the vineyard do he will come and make an end of the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the text of Scripture which says from Psalms 118, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and we marvel at it. Now he told this parable to the people, but also who specifically is right there, we already know. Right? It's the scribes and the priests and the elders all right, they're staying there. So it says, and they would have liked to arrest him right then and there because they realized that the parable was aimed at them. But they were afraid of the crowds. So they left him alone and went away. Hard hitting. It's hard hitting, right. I, there are essences there drawn again from Isaiah in the book of Woes, the first half of Isaiah. Specifically Isaiah chapter 5, I think. And, uh, and he has the same story or parallel story to it in Luke. But I think it pretty much lets us know what he's thinking, right? Yeah. And so then here again, remember, Jesus has been hesitant to declare himself the Messiah because what the Messiah has actually come to do, which in a large part is to pronounce the good news to the poor, but a judgment, a verdict that's very harsh on the leaders of Israel those who are supposed to have been the shepherds all along. So he doesn't want, because, and they expected though the Messiah to what? To probably be one of the elders, the Pharisees, the, uh, the, the priests, and then to become also a great warrior and to lead them into a, a successful revolt against the Romans. And that's not what he's up to, of course. All right. The second question. Next they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians, which is interesting alliance because they normally didn't like each other. But the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? So they're, they're bonded together and said, look, we don't like each other, but we've got a common enemy here. So let's, let's put together a strategy and see if we can trick him. The Herodians were the Jews that supported King Herod, who's now dead, the great King Herod, but still has his, his dynasty, you know, his... Uh, all right, so the whole situation that was... Big. And Herod, great, King Herod was not a Jew. He was an Idumean. And uh, Herod Jr. was part Idumean from Herod. He was also part Samaritan. His mother was a Samaritan. All the sons had different moms. Philip's mom was Cleopatra. Okay. But anyway, so they're supporting this non... Uh, 
Hebrew king, who's a vassal king really of the Gentile Romans, and they're supporting this status quo. So the Pharisees, of course, who were kind of ultra patriots, that, though they had worked out a very self-serving relation, working relationship with the Romans themselves, right? So, but they, but they didn't like the Herodians. All right. Next, they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to catch him out in what he said. This, they, these came to him and said to him, Master, we know that you are an honest man and that you are not afraid of anyone because human rank means nothing to you and that you teach the way of God in all honesty. Do they really think that? Of course not. They're, they're buttering his bread. They think, I'm going to be so clever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him off guard and make him vulnerable by making him think we actually respect him. So their question is, is it permissible to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now they're asking a question that the people around them would be very interested to hear what he says. Should we pay or not? Because remember what I told you, what was on that coin, right? Caesar, right? And, and do we pay taxes? Do we pay tribute to this, 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 this Gentile ruler? Of course, if you don't, go to jail or worse. All right, so he, they kind of figured, yeah, all right. If he says yes, they're going to say, look, you're, you're like a Herodian. You're a turncoat. Right? You, you, you're, you're a kiss up to these Romans. What kind of Messiah are you? But if he says don't pay it, then he's, he'll just turn them over to the Romans. Let the Romans say, this guy's telling everybody don't pay taxes. So we got him. Recognizing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why are you putting me to the test? Hand me a denarius and let me see it. They handed him one. By the way, they had one in their pocket. And Jesus didn't. <laughs> Hand me one. Whose portrait is this? Whose title? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said, fine. Then pay Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Well, pay God what belongs to God. And they were amazed at him. People were amazed because it's the perfect answer. His enemies were amazed because he was so stinking clever. They said, man, I didn't see that coming. All right? So they went, he shut their mouth and they went away too. Third question, then come the Sadducees. Another group. They have their own question. All right, now they don't believe in the resurrection. Nor do they believe in angels, right? Then some Sadduc Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection. Mark had to tell his Gentile audience that. Remember, this is another little clue that we know he was not writing this primarily to a Jewish audience because they would have all known that. Then some Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection came to him and they put this question to him. Master, Moses prescribed for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, that's true, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 25, the man must marry the widow to raise up children for his brother. Because at that time they were thinking... Your life lived on in your descendants. And if a man died without having a descendant, then maybe his brother could make one for him. The wife didn't have a say-so, I guess. Now there were seven brothers. Oh, man. I hate moral arguments that go to an extreme. You know, have you ever had a discussion? Well, never mind. So, so you're telling me if a 13-year-old girl was gang raped and became present, pregnant, you would make her have that child. You're just cruel. You know, say, really, we're going to argue this moral issue on, the, on such extreme cases? Because all, all moral questions have hard cases. That's true. But it's not where you argue the fundamentals of it, right? I, I said that came to mind because I've had that exact thing happen to me before. All right. Uh, master, so we have this problem. Master said that uh, a man should, right, you got it. A brother should uh, raise up children for his brother who died. Now, there were seven brothers. Is this hypothetical? Did it really happen? We don't know. The first married a wife and then died leaving children, leaving no children. The second married the widow and he too died leaving no children. With the third it was the same and none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman herself died, probably exhausted. <laughs> now at the resurrection when they rise again tongue in cheek because we don't believe there is a resurrection 
So when they rise again, whose wife will she be since she had been married to all seven? Do they really think they're proving the point there is no res resurrection by putting complicating possible scenarios there? It's just so... Ugh. All right. Jesus said to them, for this third question, Surely the reason why you are wrong is that you understand neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So first of all, here's an indictment of you before I answer your question. You who don't believe in angels or the resurrection, it's just because you don't know the scriptures, you don't know the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, so he obviously does believe in the resurrection, men and women do not marry, at least any longer. No, they are like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising again, have you never read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush, the burning bush, how God spoke to him and said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, his ancestors. Right, Moses' ancestors. And Jesus used that to prove, because he talks about it in the present tense, as if they are, I am currently their God, right? He is a God not of the dead, but of the living. So he's using that, putting those two points together to say they're alive. They're dead, but they're alive. So he's also said there will be a resurrection and life is, doesn't end when you die here, which is what they believed. So you're wrong on both points, all points, all right? By the way, I, I, I think I might endorse the Essenes too often, maybe too much. Jesus was not an Essene and they weren't right in all issues. Now on this particular issue, they believed there was life after death, but there was no use for the body anymore. The resurrection, to their mind, would have been a purely spiritual thing. Okay, so they're not there either. Just thought I'd mention that. All right, question number four. One of the scribes who had listened to them debating appreciated that Jesus had given a good answer. And put a further question to him, the fourth one of this day. Which is the first of all the commandments? This guy's got a little better heart, a little more goodwill, and he's coming from a more honest place. Jesus answered the way every good Jew would answer. The great Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is the first of them all, he says. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is the one, or is one, only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Curiously, Jesus adds, with all your mind and with all your soul. So he quotes Deuteronomy, Moses, but he did add, with all your mind too. Maybe that was a good thing he needed to add right then to these people trying to give him intellectual questions. Trying to be philosophical or so clever. So by the way, your mind too. It's good advice. Yes. My heart, my soul, that's fine, but my mind I, I'm using for other than godly purposes, which all these people were. The second commandment, though, he says, you didn't ask, but I'm going to tell you what the second one is. You must love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. In fact, those two sum up all the others. Okay? The first three all about God, the commandments. The other seven are about how we relate to each other, how we treat each other. So they're summed up in that way. Love God with all your being. Make him number one. That is how he becomes your God, really. Not just in lip service, but in actuality. And then the second is treat other people like you want to be treated. He says, no commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, well spoken, master. What you have said is true. I'm sure Jesus really appreciated his approval. He says... It, you, what you said is true, that he is one and there is no other. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, he says, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. This is far more important than any burnt offering or sacrifice. Jesus, seeing how wisely he has spoken, and of all the people that have come to him, he likes this one. And he says, you are not, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to question him any more. While teaching in the temple, same day, Jesus said, 
How can the scribes maintain that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, moved by the Holy Spirit, said, The Lord declared to my Lord, Take your seat at my right hand till I have made your enemies your footstools. So he's, he's trying to demonstrate the limited understanding of these learned ones, okay? He's also trying to point out to them something I don't think they understood. That the Christ, the Messiah, was not just a prophet or divinely inspired man, that he was God. That he was always to be God. And he's trying to point out some of the scriptures they knew and had misinterpreted where it's folded in there. He says, David himself, who was his father, calls him Lord. And to them, that would have been unthinkable. The father always has a higher respect and authority to the son. He must always be de give deference to his father and his ancestors, okay? So, so Jesus says, well, how could David call the son of David, the one you're calling the Messiah, Lord? In what way, then, can he be his son? And the great crowd listened to him with delight. Well, the great the way is he may be his descendant, but he's also going to be God. All right, so that's what he's trying to put together to them. That it's there in the scriptures. You clever ones just haven't had been smart enough to see it, and you've been teaching the wrong thing for a long time. Then he says, "Beware of the scribes, the teachers, who like to walk about in long robes, to be greeted respectfully in the market squares, to take the front seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. These are the men who devour." the property of widows, and for show offer long prayers, the more severe will be the sentence they receive. If nothing else, the people standing around must have thought, he's really got guts. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, he's talking face to face on their home turf, right here in the temple, basically calling them out, cutting them down, showing he has no respect for what they represent or teach, and then telling the people don't listen to them. Of course he's becoming their enemy. But he knew Jesus was not ever going to be a hypocrite or lie when he came to Jerusalem and started preaching openly, this is what he's going to be saying. And now the irritation with him is going to be growing to a white-hot hatred. And they're going to figure out, we've got to get rid of this guy. Okay. Now, I began a conversation with Judas about Judas last week. In this, the apostles are feeling the temperature rise, right? I don't know what they were thinking. They might have been afraid. Of this. Um, you know, you better not do much more of this. Maybe we need to get back to the Transjordania, right? It, ex except I, I think Judas might have been thinking, yeah, this is really playing out well. What I need to do is to pull the trigger. I need, I need to, the smoldering gasoline needs to have a, a match put to it. The, 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 the atmosphere is right. That if I can provoke a confrontation, and I don't think it was because he wanted Jesus killed. I told you last week, I think he thought that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was being too shy or that he was being too modest and that he, he needed Judas. <laughs> he needed Judas's plan. He was going to force him, tough love or something, into a confrontation because I said, you know, he had seen Jesus raise the dead for heaven's sakes, multiply loaves and fishes, walk on the water, calm the storms. So in his mind, if a confrontation erupted and they actually threatened Jesus with bodily harm, Jesus would have to display his divinity. I mean, his, his, the power that he had. And that would cause them to ally with him, to submit to him. And Judas, the great genius, his plan would have come about. So I think he probably smelled an opportunity in the air. Thinking these other apostles, they're so dumb, they're even dumber than Jesus. They're just really not understanding what's going on. I, with his power in my brains, we can make this Messiah thing happen. That's what I think, right? If he had wanted Jesus killed, when Jesus was killed, he'd have celebrated. But what did he do? He threw the coins back, because they ended up making a little money even on the side, which is okay with him. 
the 30 pieces of silver, he threw it, threw it back to them, and then he hung himself. His plan had failed miserably. He had a certain faith in Jesus as the Messiah, and he realized what he had done. He himself, not submitting to the wisdom of God or understanding the prophecies that Jesus gave, I will be killed, and then I will rise again. All he knew was his own plan, his own pride, and it didn't work, and to him, therefore, he was destroyed. He didn't trust Jesus. No, he trusted himself. His own pride was his God. And when that was destroyed to him, there's no reason to live. Okay? And that's why Jesus says you have to trust him with your mind. Your mind too, yes. Is there? Um, I've got a question. Uh, I heard this before, and I don't know if this is right or not, but when Jesus gave a piece of bread to Judah, uh, they mentioned that then he gave the, like, uh, the assignment to say, hey, let's do, do it now, like that. That's, that's when, when uh, you, he got with the ability to say, I'm going to turn to Right, I'm going to repeat that because I don't know if it's picking up your, your question, okay? Uh, and we're, we're not there yet, but at the Last Supper, you point out that Jesus hands Judas a morsel of bread that's been dipped in the wine, right? Yeah. Uh, and then he says, go and do what you must do. Yeah. Well, the other apostles had asked, when he predicted that there was a traitor amongst them, uh, and then Peter asked John, who was the closest to him, ask him who it is. And he said, that's the one that I'll give the bread to. So he was pointing out the traitor, but they, don't, they didn't know what that meant exactly. And the others who weren't privy to that little conversation amongst the three, when Jesus said out loud, go and do what you must do, the gospel writer says they assumed he was going to go out and uh, what was he going to do? He was going to buy something. Buy some food for the next day or provisions or whatever. Because he, he kept the money. He had the money bag. So, uh, yeah. And other people have posited at that moment then when he took it and he got up to actually go and do what he'd been planning to do. That was the last chance he had to repent. And that's when his sellout to Satan was complete. Because up to then, you know, he still, Jesus had tried and tried and tried. He still had the opportunity to not do it. But he had already arranged by that point to do it. He had gone to the high priest and the scribes and said, he's going to be staying in the Mount of Olives tonight. He's not going all the way back to Bethany after we celebrate the Passover. So if you will have some police officers ready for me, I will come af after the last meal, after the Passover meal, and I will take you to where they're camping at the Mount of Olives to arrest him. Okay, so that's what he did. And they gave him 30 pieces of silver, which was the price of a slave. Okay. So it had been set up. So then at the Last Supper, even before it was over, Jesus says, you can go now and do what you're going to do. And he did. Now he probably didn't think Jesus knew what... He, maybe he thought, Jesus thought, I'm going to go buy some food. And Jesus doesn't really realize what's going on. right? Or about that time, maybe he didn't care. I'm still going to do it. Jesus, is going to say, Jesus will thank me for this. Pretty soon. In a day or two, he's going to see what a genius I was. right? So he goes and he tells them, it's all planned out just like I told you guys it would. And they say, well, here's your temple guards. Uh, we got torches. We got clubs. We got rope. We got chain. Lead on. And that's when, that's when he took them. That was the night he was arrested. All right, we're not quite there yet. He just condemned the scribes. Uh, he, told, he told them about, you know, what hypocrites they were offering the long prayers making big sacrifices, and it's all for show. And then he exemplifies the point by getting the parable of the widow's mite, telling the story of the widow's mite, which is also uh, in Luke. And he sat down opposite the treasury there, still on the Temple Mount, and watched the people putting money into the treasury, and many of the rich put in a great deal. A poor widow came and put in two small coins, the equivalent of a penny. Nancy, do you have your widow's mite on? Uh, no, not oh, I had a prop for you. <laughs> Evidently, ar archaeologists find these things laying all over the place. So some uh, smart Christian 
Palestinians have, ma have collected these and they make little trinkets out of them. Nancy's got one that I paid way too much for. <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's simply a necklace that's got a widow's mite around it, but it's a, it's a real one from roughly this time, okay? But it's just a little, you know, less than, less than a penny, right? It's, a two, two, it's an equivalent of a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, In truth I tell you, this poor widow has put more in than all those who have contributed to the treasury, at least according to God's arithmetic. For, for they have put money in they could spare. Proportionally, it wasn't much, right? Pocket change to them may seem like a lot to you, but the whole idea was to get you very impressed with them, their spirituality, right? So, but she in her poverty has put in everything that she had, all that she had to live on. Does God need money? No. The answer is no. Right. Why then is this imperative to tithe and to give alms, which is even more than the tithe? Technically, the tithe is a commandment. That's what we owe. Everything beyond that alms is considered an additional sacrifice or gift. It's not the way we look at it usually, but scripturally, that's where it's at. But he doesn't need any of it. In what way is sacrificial giving an opportunity for us? Larry, do you have the answer? Sacrificial giving, tithing, uh, to me, are like a catalyst in a chemical reaction. Um, it's not consumed, it's not used, but it what forms the reaction to occur. And in this case, it's like showing your uh, priority to God by doing it this way. Because as Jesus says here uh, in his response to their questioning, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. He could have added all your money too, didn't he? Well, strength is really everything that you possess. All your assets. It's assets. It's your, not just the physical strength, but your strength of your assets. Yeah, your, your cattle, your sheep, your lamb, your, your servants, everything that you have is your strength uh, in, in, in this context for this. So that's to me what shows me you're a catalyst in moving God's kingdom forward. Right, right. So well, I think uh, what he's pointing out here, though, giving pocket change that will never miss, what I like to say, giving God a tip, <laughs> is not it's almost counterproductive. God doesn't need the money, but to giving something that's relatively meaningless to us kind of robs us of any sacrificial aspect of it. Sacrificial giving is giving to the point that, you know, I might miss that in some way, huh? but I'm willing to risk it. Now, the widow gave up everything she had. This meant she didn't know where her next meal was coming from, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about though if we give something that in our mind is significant in proportion to what I make or what my needs are, then I am actually stepping out into the realm of faith a little bit. And it's a, it's a physical prayer that obviously God honors. It actuates. It, it, you said a chemical reaction, right? So it act, it active, it, the way that faith activates all prayers, this is a way of demonstrating it to God and to ourselves, by the way, and to ourselves. You know, so if you, if you have your envelope and you're about to drop in the bag and going, <laughs> maybe next week. No, you put it in and say, well, I, I hope God comes through because I, I, I'll, I'll miss that maybe in some small way. That's the same way with fasting. Fasting is not just eating low cal. It's, it's giving up something that you, you will miss. It will make you a little hungry. Or you're going to miss it when, no matter what it is you're giving up. But it's another way of stepping out into, stepping out of the realm of I'm providing for myself or I have enough to a realm of I'm in need of God and always, and now I recognize it, and now it's physically true. Okay? I'm relying on faith alone. Wasn't the widow um, knowing that God would take care of her? I, I hope so. Um, or maybe that was even secondary that I want to 
reverence God. I, want, I, I feel the need to also contribute. And I don't have much, so I'll at least give all that I have. This doesn't mean anything to anybody, she might have been thinking. But little did she know, it meant everything to God. Because Jesus says, I tell you right now, in heaven, God's arithmetic, she gave the most today. Okay? And that's the beautiful point of the whole story. It also, it also underscores what he's trying to teach his disciples because it wasn't so many verses before when he's telling them, if you have faith and believe in God, the size of a mustard seed, right. to be thrown into the sea. And it's like every time he's, he's just giving these snippets of power of faith to his disciples so that they don't fall, so that they don't right. uh, weary, grow weary or, or, or confused or uh, unfulfilled uh, or, or disillusioned. That he's explaining to them so that they grow in that faith right. uh, all along. And I just love the way he just brings them along at each point here right. and, and builds that. Right. This teaching is for his apostles and all of the potential believers sitting around. He's teaching them things of God. Things that the Pharisees, the scribes, had all failed to get across to them. They were teaching the technical law and a lot of the ways to get around the stipulations of the law. And Jesus is trying to get to the heart of the matter and say what matters to God. Okay? Got another one? Which, when you say that about the law, the importance of that is he's destroying the temple cult. And the things that he's saying to them, love your neighbor as yourself, replaces all of the temple traditions and teachings and practices and says this is what's the most important. You know, it doesn't just replace them. It doesn't just replace them. Those were the primordial commandments before any of the laws of Deuteronomy or Leviticus were added. And they were added as a punishment, really. But the original, before the golden calf revolt, were the Ten Commandments, which Jesus has just summarized, okay? So he's kind of not re replacing them so much, but with teaching them what's, what's fundamental, all right? All right, now... On, on building on what Sylvia said about faith, I believe that the woman had enough faith that, it, that she would give Jesus all she had. And that she would be all right. Right, because a lot of us would, would say, well, as soon as God blesses me with a ton, I'll be glad to give a little of it back. <laughs> then I'll tithe, right? But surely God doesn't expect me to tithe on my, my penny when then she gives the whole thing. She gives all of it. Right, right. so she, it's, she, it's, it's a very inspirational story of just simple faith. Being noticed by God and no one else. Being commended by Jesus Christ. But in the economy, the worldview of that time, she was totally insignificant. These hypocrites were the important people. They were the holy ones. They were the examples. Look at that robe he's got on. Look how beautiful his public prayer is. Look at that pile of money he just dumped in there. Surely this guy is close to God and I need to be just like him. Which is exactly what they wanted everyone to think. Not true. Thank you. That's right. All right, now, this is important. As he's leaving the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Master, look at the size of those stones. And the stones that were used to build that temple were, they were big. All right, I'm trying to look for something that, anybody remember what a Volkswagen van looked like? It, that big or bigger, okay? And they were cut from far away. The quarry had to be way out of earshot of the, whole, of the temple area. And then they were, no heavy equipment now, and then they were drugged to the temple. And they'd been building this thing for about 40 years. And it would be another 30 years before it's finished. But it's already very impressive looking. It's totally functional. And so they're, they're impressed. Look at the size of those stones. Look at the size of those buildings. And Jesus said to, to him, so one of the disciples said that. One of the Galilean fishermen who country comes to town, right? Look at the size of this baby. Let me finish the sentence and I'll say. He says, he says you see these great buildings, not a single stone will be left one on another. Everything 
will be pulled down. He's going to go on to give a deeper explanation of the Olivet Discourse. Who had their hand up? Was it you? Go ahead, Zach. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Uh, one of the things uh, we don't have today, uh, and there are no other kinds of most of what we are doing in those days, uh, is the fact that we make this assumption that they didn't have an equipment to to carry this big stone from one point to another. Because today we barely do. Yeah. Uh, the pyramids were built even before then. And the stones of the pyramid were very big. Yeah. Very, very big. Somebody had to carry them down there. It's not just by dragging them on the ground or something. That was, they had something to use. Well, there's other, there's other ways. I mean, if you had two wheels and an axle, which was done, because they had carts. I mean, they had, they had I mean, I didn't, I didn't meant that they drug them there. I've, you see, I've seen pictures where they, they put down logs and they roll them, you know, and, and as you finish this log, you put it in front. Kind of the same way they build railroads now, right? You just, you're on it and you're continually building it. So there would have been ways besides just dragging them, but it still would have been very difficult, very difficult. Now the Egyptians, the Egyptians had the advantage to have, they had slaves. They had the whole Jewish nation there, and they were slaves to build the temples. Uh, these, were the, these were the people being hired and paid very little, but being, they were taking advantage of poor people who would work uh, really hard for a little bit of money. And they're the ones that had been employed by Herod with the uh, approval of the Romans to build this temple. Yeah, I agree. And, and they had the mathematical ability and capacity to, to minimize the force used to place those things on us. Oh, yeah. Which we, don't, which we don't actually know the exact. Right. The they, they, had, they, had, they had forms of engineering and architecture that we don't, and in some ways were superior. I mean, the way some of these things fit together it was amazing. It's, a, it's amazing. And that, that was your point, wasn't it? Yeah, we don't look at them as some sort of a troglodytes that weren't smart. These are very, they may not have had a bulldozer and a crane, but they were... They built some magnificent structures, not just in Israel, but all around the ancient world. These people were as smart as we are. Uh, okay. Look at Rome. Yeah, Rome, Rome was built at this time, and Greece before that. All right, so here, here we go. All right, so he's, he's given that prophecy of not one single stone is going to be left on another, and everything will be pulled down. That's just the opening salvo of what he's going to talk about here. And while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, facing the temple, I told you, so now they're heading back to Bethany, maybe stopped for a break, and they're sitting there on the Mount of Olives, and right there is the whole Temple Mount, that they had just commented on how magnificent it was. Facing the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew questioned him when they were by themselves. Tell us, when is this going to happen? And what sign Will there be that it is all about to take place? So everyone pretty much agrees nowadays that Jesus was crucified in 30 A.D. Okay? A generation is 40 years, scripturally. And the temple will be destroyed. We know from history it's not in scriptures. The scriptures were all complete by the time, well, maybe John, but he didn't mention it. But, but it was, uh, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. It's 40 years after Jesus is about to speak. He says, take care that no one deceives you. Don't get conned. All right? He's going to go on to say, in my mind, well, all these other things he's going to say are, be patient, be vigilant, be, be ready, be calm too. Take care that no one deceives you. Many will come using my name and saying, I am he. And they will deceive many. We know from the historian Josephus, Flavius Josephus, in his Antiquity of the Jews, that during this period of time between Jesus and onward, there were many who claimed to be the Messiah. And some of them had some followers. Some of them even had a little local success. Ultimately, they were all proven to be imposters. Okay? This is something that must happen, but the end will not be yet. For a nation will fight against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. 
This is the beginning of the birth pangs. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to Sanhedrins. You will be beaten in synagogues. Little do they know that's only a few months away. And you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as evidence to them, since the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when you, have taken to be hand, when you are taken to be handed over, do not worry beforehand about what to say. No, say whatever is given to you when the time comes, because it is not you who will be speaking, it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will come forward against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be universally hated on account of my name. But anyone who stands firm to the end will be saved. All right, so he's talking to them. And he's talking to all those who will come after them, right? As this proclamation, which began in their time to the ends of the, ends of the earth, will continue on into all the generations to come. But what, what in essence does it mean? He says, don't prepare ahead of time. It's not you who he's speaking, it is the Holy Spirit. Even if everyone else has abandoned you, as he goes on to say. Even your own family, thinking, this, he's gone crazy. He's an enemy. He's a Christian. And this day may come again, I don't know. You may be considered by many an enemy to the way the world should be, and to right order, and to right government, perhaps, and to all the rest of it. You'll be persecuted. Put in jail. Some of you may be put to death. But, but what did he just not say right there? What I heard sort of just screaming at me from those lines. Don't worry. It won't be you. It'll be the Holy Spirit. In other words, you'll never be alone. And a lot of Christians, some were martyred and some were not. But a lot of them have been put, in our day still, are put in jails and dungeons, beaten, treated badly. Isolated from the rest of the community. And a lot of them killed. But they're ne they were never alone. That's why I think that this, this line here is just so powerful to those thousands, countless thousands of followers of Jesus who through the centuries have gone through exactly this. Imprisonment and abandonment and false trials and experienced hatred and rejection thrown into dismal dungeons. But the promise of God is that you'll never be alone. I just think it's powerful, okay? And important. All right, before I go on and read now, because a million questions will come to mind and almost none of them will I be able to answer adequately. Uh, he's now going to give a... Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Good thing I didn't get into that. <laughs> You're on a run. Hey, I'm enjoying it. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Right. No, it's time to end. So we will do the... Uh, I was actually going to try to finish next week. Well, we'll just see what the Lord does. Wherever He goes. Right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. Mark, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.